Women work because they have to, and they're getting angry, and they're beginning to organize all around the country, and I support them, and I'm going to make a movie. Everybody was very nervous about the movie because it was three female leads. The core message in 9 to 5 was, you deserve better. Welcome to another TMG interview. My name is Paul Preston, talking to the filmmaking team behind Still Working 9 to 5, a title that really says everything you need to know about the documentary. It's about the insanely popular 1980 film, its legacy and expansion into other forms of entertainment, and unfortunately, its relevancy today as decent working conditions and equal pay remain a fight for female workers around the world. But I'm happy to have with me co-director Gary Lane and producer Larry Lane. Thank you for coming. Let's Thank you. Thank you for having us. I'm applauding, and I'm sure they're applauding wherever they're watching or listening now. Uh, I'm going to ask this first question of Gary. So if you don't know, Gary and Larry are twin brothers. So I don't know if you're listening to this as an audio podcast. Maybe even their voices sound the same. I don't know. So let's separate Let's sep- separate you out, Gary, uh, first by uh, telling telling everyone about the film. I gave a brief overview, but what from the film are the takeaways you think that will stick with the viewer? I think the takeaways that people are going to notice, it's been 42 years since the original and all of the issues that they tried to shine a light on through comedy, you know, were equal pay, sexual harassment, universal daycare and childcare. So those issues that women are still dealing with today, I think that's going to be, you know, shocking to people that this movie hit on all those issues 42 years ago, and they're still not, you know, fixed in society for working women. And that's the a big takeaway I think they'll have. And really the reason we wanted to make the film was we started thinking about what's ever been a movie, a television show, a Broadway play, but it's gone back to London, it's, you know, on the West End and it's going all around the world. So we started looking at wanting to do the movie and we're like, you know, we could do a documentary. So then Gary reached out to Camille and you can explain that part of it. That was confusing because Larry jumped in and stepped on me for the listeners at home. So we do that all the time. <laughs> but he didn't answer your question. You said, why did you make the film? And I thought he was going to go into that. So go ahead. We just wanted to just really address the issues and found out there was an organization of working women and we've kind of got the best of both worlds, the fandom and the feminism. And I think people are going to be entertained as well as informed with the project. Yeah, that was one thing. I, I, I like a doc where I learned something. You know, I appreciate a doc that has a, uh, an opinion or appreciate one that's all about nostalgia. But when I learned something, that's cool too. So you mentioned the 9 to 5 National Association of Working Women. Now, to me, this seems like something that the film would have inspired, but it was out before the film. The way that worked into history was Karen Nussbaum and Ellen Cassidy were the two women who found that organization in Boston. They started the 9 to 5 or for working women and Karen became really good friends with Jane Fonda at different events for you know different things they were fighting for and Karen told Jane the stories of what the women office would have to go through because she was on herself and her day job was working the organization so that's when Jane said I really want to make a movie about this so that friendship that has stayed with them is what really started nine to five and why Jane pushed to move to do the movie and why she wanted the issues from the organization to be in there and we interviewed Karen and Ellen from the nine to five organization and they're such a great part of the film because without them and that start of his it would have never you'd have never had a movie a song the tv series everything that nine to five has become without those two ladies wanting to do that selflessly in 1973 in boston to try to help women get a leg up in the office another thing i discovered actually i knew this but totally forgot that the director of this movie is colin higgins i love colin higgins and if you don't know who he is and you're you're you know, not as deep a movie fan as maybe I or some other people have delved into the 70s, but he wrote Harold and Maude, that's mentioned in the film, but let's not forget, wrote and directed Foul Play, a fantastic Goldie Hawn Chevy Chase movie, and wrote the script for Silver Street. Can, can you guys just show a little love for Colin Higgins? We wanted to really show the history of Colin and what he brought to the film, because it was kind of taking a dark turn And then when Colin came in, he really brought the humor, but was still able to focus on the issue. So he really was a mastermind behind the project. And, you know, I know that he came on for Jane. Jane really wanted him on the project. And he went on to have an amazing career. And, you know, we did lose Colin much too young. So he was just a a really brilliant person and really shined a light on this film and gave it a good start. Yeah. And you talk about 
comedy, I think it's a, one of the best gateways to a message, whether it's Michael Moore using comedy to make you understand a progressive agenda or Mark Maron. I saw Mark Maron last night in Santa Barbara and, you know, his girlfriend, Lynn Shelton, passed a few years ago. And that guy uses comedy to handle grief. So um, it seems like a, a no brainer that comedy was used to handle women's inequality in the workplace now that it's 42 years and removed. But at the time, it was something Jane fought for right and it's a serious treatise on wrongdoing by men <laughs> would have fallen flat or not been able to reach out to those who otherwise would ignore the message yeah the cool thing was as i remember when the women were filming it when the women were actually filming they were told when they were promoting it that they were to make sure it's a comedy it's a comedy it's a comedy because they were worried about selling tickets and they didn't want it to get too serious or people would have actually you know, they don't want to get too serious or people would have not gone to see it. They were told to, you know, let people know it was a comedy. But even Dabney says, you know, the best way to get people to learn something is to make it funny because they're going to listen. They're going to laugh, but they're going to learn something. Absolutely. Uh, this is Gary. One thing we really wanted to focus on, just like the movie had to hide the issues behind humor in the documentary. We've got a lot of serious issues. We're trying to show you talking about the ERA, talking about Me Too and Time's Up. But we're also taking you down memory lane of nine to five behind this stuff that the actors are sharing that you've never heard before. You know, we're an archival documentary, so we have over a thousand different photos and clips of the actors and so it's really going to be interesting and, and we're excited for everyone to see it but they're also going to learn a message which is women need to be in the constitution why hasn't the era passed and we're hoping we have like a call to action film that might actually get that passed because it needs to pass and from the fan side we really hope to make a sequel of <laughs> nine to five. <laughs> oh yeah what do you think sequel or reboot which is the better way to to go there I think they would go sequel route, sequel, sequel with cameos, because we yeah. definitely want the originals to be in it. So we have to figure that one out. So, yeah, that seems to be the thing nowadays. If you the expansion of the universe of a movie, whether it's Creed or Jurassic World or something, rather than starting it all over again, I think people would want to see those those something new, but those characters and where they are now. That's exactly why we did that with the new song, because, you know, we went there and we re-recorded it with Dolly Parton and Kelly Clarkson. It's a whole different spin. It's a lot haunting. It's darker because really the documentary is to show that it's not funny anymore. We're still dealing with this issue. So Dolly and them really wanted to try to redo something with a song. And I think it came out amazing, which will bring a whole new younger demographic. You know, they'll be following Kelly, but then they're going to learn a lot about it as well. Because the original nine to five was upbeat and optimistic. And this one is it's not because the issues are still there. So I think this new nine to five version, Dolly's camp is excited about it. Kelly's camp is excited about it. And the South by Southwest audiences, they get an exclusive on it because it's in our end credits. And Dolly and Kelly went in studio to record themselves performing it. But only that audience will get to see it right now because this, the song will not be released probably until around May. Uh, it's going to coincide, hopefully, with our streaming release. So they'll have to wait a little bit for it. And I should point out that even the documentary is funny. So there's plenty of funny and charming moments there as well. So you're not going to see a documentary where it's like, we're still not getting what we want. And then, again, it follows the same path as the film itself. It's funny and entertaining and the message comes across. One thing we um, we to make a film that was fun because, you know, you do have those, you know, where you're kind of to the masses, you're preaching to the ones that always hear the same message. We wanted to bring people in with the nine to five fandom because everybody loves nine to five and then kind of give them this message of, hey, you need to pay attention because things still haven't changed for working women. So we're really hoping we do reach a wider audience with this film. So going back, tell me about Hollywood to Dollywood. I'm not sure how I didn't know about this, but I found out you guys were in a documentary uh, about traveling from Hollywood to Dollywood to see Dolly. And so yes. did that give you some relationship to Dolly that then could help you bring that, her into this doc? Yes, that helped us a lot because that was like a, a road trip documentary where we had written a script and we gave her the script and it was a whole thing. It was the floods of Nashville. Like you could not have written it. That was 10 years ago when that was all happening. And we did meet her. We gave her the script and then they graciously let us use 15 of her songs in the film. So it kind of became like a traveling, uh, you know, documentary about you know the songs and being on the road and it, it really did well we won a lot of film festival awards and all over the world got in there with dolly and she you know she's kind of known us through the years now so then when this project came around 
is a you know much bigger scale she you know she's just been right on board we really knew her her um creative director steve summer said well what i want to do we told him about the idea he said i love the title i think it's great why don't i get you guys to sit down with dolly and i think once we get dolly on camera and attach her everybody else will come along and that's exactly what happened once dolly came in everybody kind of fell into place and fun side note beth grant is in uh hollywood at dollywood who i love beth grant and so how does she tie into the entire thing because anytime you get to see her uh, it's we, an amazing thing we've just been friends with beth forever so she had done a movie with dolly so we wanted to interview her and she was really funny because the script was way too long it was like when you held it in your hands it like weighed your hands down so we went and met beth and and different like chad allen and uh, lance black leslie Did jordan leslie jordan different along the way the different people in the industry were telling us how to get it ready and that to her, that was part of the anticipation. So that was she was just great. We've been friends with Beth and Leslie Jordan for a long time. Great. Yeah, I mean, who hasn't been in a movie with Beth Grant? She's works they're nonstop. They're great crazy. character actors. Beth yeah. Grant and Leslie Jordan are two of the best, you know, character yeah, actors. Uh, but let's get to the three women at the forefront of the movie Nine to Five, and of course, in your doc, that's Jane Fonda, Lily Tomlin, and Dolly Parton. Um, you don't get them. I mean, I think there's trouble with the film. So the fact that they all came on board and provided fantastic interviews and their powerhouse, you know, presence was great. So one by one in the film, I mentioned Jane Fonda walks the walk in her interview. She's wearing a fire drill Friday shirt, which is, of course, yeah. one of her causes to, you know, bring awareness to how poorly we're handling climate change. So what did you see in interviewing her that said, oh, yeah, this is the legend actress and activist Jane Fonda. Well, I have to give Camille credit because Camille kind of did the Barbara Walters style interview. She interviewed every one of them. So we were there helping do the whole everything. But um, we purposely Jane for last because it was her idea and she was the glue that brought it all together. So we interviewed Dolly first and then we interviewed Lily. And Lily was just, a, we laughed the whole time. Like when we left Lily's interview, your side hurts because you laugh at everything <laughs> yeah. she says. So she was just a really good interview. And then uh, we did interview Jane in DC at Fire Drill Fridays. That was one of the stipulations where we were able to get her. We had to go there to get her, which was fine because it was an amazing interview. And, you know, she just really opens up and she lets you in. And a lot of people don't know that she is the person that created 9 to 5. It was her brainchild along with Bruce Gilbert. So, you know, she kind of gave that uh, to the world. And we just thought she was very, she was very, open with us she was very kind and we just really appreciated her time because they're all icons and but so everything busy. everything jane said was on point we're like oh sound bite sound bite sound bite she's just she really she's is professional. professional yeah and and you mentioned lily Thomas as being hilarious she is a legendary comedian yet one revealing moment from the doc is when she talks about how she doubted some of the jokes in the script and then admits in the doc she was wrong. So I thought that was a pretty cool moment when, you know, this uh, a nice admission that this icon of comedy kind of humanized her. She, she honestly, you know, she she's very critical of herself. She doesn't and she still doesn't look at the dailies because of what happened there. She had to pretend like the little cartoon birds and Snow White were all around her and those little animals and they weren't there. And she didn't like how she looked. And that was what that scene is about. So she really opens up about, you know, she likes to know the jokes and tell when the jokes are going to land. And Colin would say, that's not going to land. And then she gave him credit. She's like, Colin was right. It never landed. So just things like that. We we grew up loving the movie 9 to 5. We learned so much with hearing Dabney Coleman and all of care about being on set. And they all knew what the movie meant. They knew it was a comedy, but they also knew it was being made for working women at the time, right? To give them a voice. So, and then all these years later to get these actors to sit down again and still focused on the fact that those issues still aren't fixed. It's kind of, it's sad in a way, but they really are optimistic about how we can make the changes if we all kind of come together. And yeah, it's got to be, I mean, I can imagine these Marvel actors, you know, just like looking at a green thing and then another green thing over here and then looking up at a green thing and then responding to a big green thing on a stage where there's absolutely nothing and then leaving for the day going, was I good? I mean, not even, what the hell's going on here? And then of course it turns out, oh, it's like the biggest movie ever made. So clearly it was a big success. I can imagine Lily looking at a fake bird probably felt weird, especially in 1980. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we even got some of the pencil tests where you see her and you see the little birds drawn in. So we, our archivists, we had two amazing archivists just found things like treasures we could never dream of that we've got in this film. So we're excited for 
people to just see all of that as well. It's over a thousand archival items, as I said, and that's not easy to do to license and track all those those things down. It's not cheap either. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, you mentioned Dabney Coleman, too. I mean, he's in your doc. Uh, unsung comedy hero of the 80s, if you ask me. Nine to five, Tootsie, uh, the Buffalo Bill, his TV show. Um, so, like with Colin Higgins, just show Dabney Coleman some love. Dab- yeah, I'll, say, I'll tell you one thing that was great that we learned from Dabney Coleman is his agent did not want him to take nine to five because they had already written him apart in Private Benjamin, which is huge. We had no idea. Yeah. And he he was adamant. He turned the Private Benjamin thing down. He's like, I'm taking Mr. Hart. There's something about this part. So he had already booked that thing on Private Benjamin, which they both come out in 1980. Mm-hmm. So, but you've got to remember when we're interviewing Dabney, we interviewed Dabney in uh, February of 2020. So he was our last interview before COVID shut the world down. So we were able to edit all the way through the lockdown, which really helped us. But Dabney, he's 90, Mr. Hart. He was sharp as a tack. He remembered Jane walking into that safari outfit and how amazing she looked. So just hearing him talk in interviews. And then we saw him on Yellowstone. He, you know, Kevin Costner's dad. So he's, he's still working and still doing on his thing he, he was just a really great interview to bring the four of them together we were so glad we got Dabney as well as the ladies yeah I was just gonna say that it was Boardwalk Empire before that and the other the guy just still working always working yeah. and Amazing. apparently always in the at one of the clubs down in was it Dan Tana's or something you go to the bar you'll find him telling stories and he's a rip apparently <laughs> yeah. uh now and then Dolly of course would be our third big legend uh has a great moment where she talks about this being her film debut and if it goes well she's gonna you know say hey I did it and if it goes poor well we'll blame it on <laughs> Lily and Jane, which oh, Jane is really. so I imagine you don't prompt her to say that but when you just put her in front of the camera you get gems right yeah. And the one thing about Dolly is we had we sent the questions over to Dolly. And when she got the question, she goes, this is a question. Maybe we should go early. She came 15 minutes early just so we could get all the questions. In. So really a lot about her. So, you know, and she was great. Everything she said was amazing. We also liked the way she really opened up about you know, she was a little fearful of Jane because Jane was kind of, you know, frowned on a little bit of time or, you know, she's like, and I found a different side of Jane, like side of Jane. And I felt like we were making a movie about women too. So that's what I focus on. And she still has a bit of this day. But you really hear a lot in the documentary. You heard Dolly talk about a lot of things like equal pay, because a lot of times she's very middle of the road because of her fan bases and all that. So you really hear her open up for equality and fair is fair, equal rights. Equal pay. We get a lot of stuff from Dolly in this documentary that, you know, a lot of people haven't heard from her. So a lot of people love her take on it. Well, that's great. Uh, but, and also, well, no, I want to ask this question first. Anyone you didn't get, Gloria Steinem, Hillary Clinton, I mean, who could, <laughs> a witch list or no, something? We, that made... Well, one thing we found out, because the one thing about it, we did over 65 interviews and through the editing process and the 90 minutes, we, we only have about 33 of those in there. So there's so many that didn't make it in. And then when you kind of, we wanted Rita Moreno from the 9 to 5 TV series, we got her. Alice and Janney and Stephanie J. Block and Megan Hilty from the nine to five musical cast. Because one thing that we do that we thought was very creative is we follow the nine to five timelines. You have the movie, the song, the TV show, the musical, the musical, and then you have possible sequel. Because when we started making this, the sequel was not canceled. It was still going to happen. And then we also follow the working movement. So there's a lot of times in the movie where they intersect at the same time so we kind of you had to do it and bruce gilbert said i give you all props because it's hard to take a documentary 42 year span and he said and the way you guys have it edited and you've got the different parallels you really do a good job to keep it relevant with the stepping stones to get you from 1980 to 2022 this is a perfect time for me to bring up a question i always ask when i interview documentary filmmakers let's give that shout out to the editor and perhaps the editing team it looked like there was a, a a head editor and then perhaps an assistant because yeah a lot of times in the documentary hey here's a bunch of footage uh make a movie <laughs> you know? now i know yes. you guys of course uh, uh, you guys go through and you figure out what could be storylines and you work together but i don't think there's a greater director editor relationship than in a documentary so give them give them a shout out we definitely want to give a shout out to our amazing editing team that's elisa benora and o Rees. they have stayed with us for two and a half years of really hard edits and long sessions. So we, they're a great team and they're going to be at South by Southwest with us for the, for the premiere. So we're excited. 
we would go film the Lily interview and then we drop that in and they'd have to pepper her through. And then we'd get Dabney next and we'd send it over. And so we were kind of editing as still filming interviews and mm. it's not easy to do, but that's the way we had to do it with all the schedules we were with. Um, so they're just an amazing editing team. We've seen so many edits. We had like the four hour edit that got cut down to three, that got down to two, <laughs> and then it got down to, you know, an 40, cutting off that last 15 minutes, no matter what anybody says, is the hardest thing to do. Because, And it, I'll throw it back to Beth Grant because she's like, you have to kill your precious ones because there's, so <laughs> there's so many things you want to stay in there and it just can't all stay in there. So we're so happy. We feel like we've got a really tight film that really hones in on the issues but still keeps people laughing all the Having way through. Fun. Yeah, Beth's been in three or four best pictures. Well, we should take her advice, I suppose, right? Oh, we take her <laughs> advice. <laughs> Normally, I ask filmmakers about the festival run they've had, but uh, I guess you haven't. You're world premiering at South by Southwest, so there couldn't be like a more. But oh yeah, go ahead. I was going to tell you, we actually we're already getting in some very big ones after South by Southwest. So our, our website is still working 925.com, the number 925.com, because we got into a huge one coming up in a, the end of April. And we did get into a big one in Palm Springs that's going to also be in April. So people can follow our journey, but we've got some good ones coming. But South by Southwest, as you said, that is the premiere. So it's March 13th. We're, we are the opening weekend matinee at 345. We're excited about that. Then we have another screen on the 14th and another screening on the 18th of March. So we're going to be with Camille. We're going to be at all three festivals doing the Q&As and just experiencing South by Southwest because we've never been. So we're very excited about that. And just a couple more things. You talked about the stage musical of 9 to 5. That's mentioned in the film. And you go in depth on the song and you go in depth. On, yeah, uh, the t television show, you, you cover everything. And that Broadway show crossed my path. Uh, twice in 2009 I was in New York for a wedding I wanted to see a Broadway show schedule just worked out where all I could check out was nine to five so say hey who doesn't love Allison Janney and Megan Hilty and Stephanie Block from Southern California who did a bunch of shows in my neck of the woods um, and I saw it and it was great and then cut to 2015 I'm playing Franklin Hart at a production of nine to five at the Glendale oh, wow. Center Theater here in Southern California. So I don't do many musicals. I'm not like a Colm Wilkinson or anything like that. I'm kind of, if it's funny and weird, I'm in. I mean, I've done Crazy For You, 9 to 5, and Spam a lot. Get the idea. Um, that's, I, that's When it's weird, I'm your guy. But uh, <laughs> I, we knew we hit the sweet spot every night when the crowd would go nuts when Hart gets his comeuppance. So uh, what is your history with the show? Have you seen it? Have you seen it a bazillion times? I mean, obviously, I think you went to oh, yeah. London, yeah? Yes, we went to London. So we actually, uh, we saw the, we saw the musical, the original New York musical in 2009. We saw it twice. We saw it in and, then, and we also went and filmed the London musical. But one thing, a, a really cool scene in the, that didn't make it into all the interviews uh, was when we interviewed everybody, Megan, Hilty, Stephanie J. Black, Allison, Jenny, and Mark Kudish, who was, who played Mr. Hart. There was a scene where he falls into the pit and it's one of the fantasy sequences and they had had a long day of rehearsals and they came around and told everybody don't fall into the pit this time. So they told Mark don't go in the pit because there's usually a mattress he falls on. So for whatever reason, the mattress wasn't there. And so when they yelled action, they started going to the scene. Allison was there and behind him yelling like it was a fantasy and Mark went in the pit on his back straight down 10 feet and hit really hard. And Allison started screaming, the whole production stopped. So when we would interview Megan and Stephanie and Allison, when they all remembered the pit, they all got chills and they, started and, and and they got like, really man. emotional because they, they had to take them away in the ambulance. And, you know, it, there's just great stories we got that couldn't all make it in there. But they had such a great, you know, the core team there. They had such a bond. They worked on it for over a year in rehearsals and everything. And Dolly wrote all the music and Patricia Resnick was there. So they hated to see that in. It only had Kathy Fitzgerald who plays Ross. She's amazing. We love Kathy. She was the Raza. But it oh, only man. had about a seven month run. And unfortunately, because things hadn't happened like Me Too and all the things that came a little bit later, it wasn't as relatable where the fans could hold on to it. So it did have to cancel. But then in 2019, after all of that, the, the people could latch onto those issues a little more, the women we're still dealing with. So with a couple of rewrites and a few new songs by Dolly, it's now gone in London. It's just opened in Australia after the pandemic. It's still going all over the world because it just needed a new life and it needed to galvanize it like me too and time's up. All right, before we get to plugs and where you can see the uh, progress of the film, uh, I ask this of everyone I interview. 
So we'll start first with Gary, then go to Larry. Gary, what is your favorite movie of all time? Favorite movie of all time. And I'm going to go one I've seen. I've seen this movie probably 30 times or more, and I'll watch it anytime it's on. It's Titanic. I just thought it was an amazing film and all the characters in it, even Kathy Bates. And I love all the behind the scenes stuff. Like I love knowing that Kathy Bates had 30 minutes of, of her footage get cut out of the film. And I love all the behind the thing that got to how you made Titanic. And I just thought it was a great film. I mean, and not the sad ending, but the way it was done, getting up to that moment was amazing. Even the song that went in with it. And it makes me look at a film from the beginning to the end. And I try to look at it with like, if, if it was a documentary, like I'd love to interview the cast again about what that experience was like. And I think mine would be, I love the Harry Potters. I think I've seen them all 55 times. <laughs> <laughs> I could write it up. Yeah, I love those. Anyway. Starting with the books and then yeah, going to the, yeah. the movies. Yeah. We're huge fans of that. And still going. And and I the, the, birds. the Birds was a great movie too. I love The Birds. The Birds? <laughs> Tom, Tom Hanks? Yeah, The Birds. Yeah, wow. The Birds. I was just, I can't watch that either. That was a funny <laughs> movie. We still quote it to this day. Uh, if you haven't, you got to get the Leaves in Studios in just outside of London. They've retained everything, if you haven't been there, from the Harry Potter movies. Oh, I'm sorry, we're supposed to go. We're hoping uh, Rain Dance will be our UK premiere in October of this year. So if we go there in October with the film, we will go and do the whole Harry Potter experience. Yeah, you will not be disappointed. I mean, literally everything from the, what is it, the night bus to the exteriors for uh, Privet Lane to the Great Hall oh, wow. and all the places where the students lived in the Weasley's home and Dumbledore's office. I mean, it's all there. They kept everything. Someone knew that this is going to be massive. So uh, did you watch the uh, reunion show on HBO Max? Oh, yeah, it was amazing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> she did. A lot of great cast there. There was a lot we missed, like Maggie Smith. There was a lot we were kind of wondering, but I know Maggie's still doing well and still with us. So there's there's some of our favorites we would like to see, but we saw a lot of our favorites only. It was a great special. Yeah, it was surprisingly effective. I thought it might be cheesy, but then as it went along, it just was really authentic and effective. It was so. emotional. Yeah. It was yeah. Good. And I love Titanic. I mean, any backlash against that movie has to come talk to me because I will slap it down because it, that movie is awesome. Such a great film. Yes, yeah, a yeah. great film. You know, it's it's a shame Cameron only makes the number of movies he makes because James Cameron is, you know, so demanding technically. It's I think he thinks up a movie then has to wait 10 years for the technology to catch up to his ideas. Like Avatar. Uh, Avatar. Avatar. I love the Avatar. I'm ready for the second we're, one. And it's we're been still waiting for the, other, the next one. 12 years or more. All right. Well, uh, gentlemen, I watched Still Working 9 to 5. Now I want to see Hollywood to Dollywood. So um, what are the plans for everyone else to see still working nine to five? Uh, there, obviously, you're hoping for a sale, perhaps, from one of these festivals. Is that how this yes, next step a, goes? Yes, we have a sales agent and we're kind of doing like all the other films that go to South by Southwest. We've been pretty lucky because I think with the Dolly, Lily, Jane and Dabney reunion and the buzz around the new nine to five with Dolly and Kelly Clarkson, We've been getting press that we would never have imagined, like they talked about on today's show and played our trailer. And we were like, how does this happen? Because we didn't even know about it. Yeah. So, and, and you know, Dolly, we just saw some press because she's hosting the ACM Awards. So she started being asked about the duet with Kelly Clarkson, the new nine to five duet. And she's like, well, it's from a nine to five documentary. And so when she starts, it's in her narrative, we can't even hardly wrap our heads around it. So I think that the fans may be really wanting this because the sequel got canceled on them. So maybe Maybe we're going to fill that void of the sequel right now because we've got them all together and we've got a new nine to five. And it's really interesting hearing what they were thinking back in 1980 when they were doing this film. You know, they kind of go down memory lane with you. So it's very entertaining. And then, like you said, it's very educational as well. Yeah, you picture yourselves in that van driving to Knoxville. And now there's Dolly talking about your movie on a red carpet somewhere. It's crazy, right? Exactly. We can't even wrap around it but we're we're happy to be in north carolina with the family and we are just going to go experience south by southwest and really enjoy it because it's been four years of really hard work to kind of get to this point where the world's going to see it i think our first the matinee screening it'll be 100 people in it. so just to kind of sit there with all of those people watching it, it's, it's going to be an experience that we'll be proud of. well uh that wraps another TMG interview. Follow the movie guys at the movie guys pretty much everywhere. That's Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, as well as YouTube, iTunes, Instagram. 
Uh, if you heard this show or on in one of the audio podcast formats or watched it on YouTube, or there are archives you can fish through for all sorts of fun stuff. Thanks to Gary and Larry Lane. And, and again, still working 925.com. Any other plugs for social or anything like that you guys have people should check out? Um, our, our Twitter and Instagram are at still working nine to five. That's nine and then T O five. And then Facebook is still working nine to five. Pretty much everything is still working nine to five. And it's all at the website is all of our socials and things. We have like merchandise and some fun stuff that I think the fans will love. And as ever, you can find everything we're up to at the movie guys, including reviews, articles, and more at the movie guys.net. Thanks guys. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Very nice talking to you.